Okay, yeah. good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jose Maria Garcia, and I will be the moderator of this first part of the webinar towards high fidelity simulations of renewable fuels at relevant conditions of IC engines, challenges and opportunities. So I'm just going to be slightly slow at the beginning so that I hope more people can join. Um, first of all, obviously, thanks for, for joining the webinar. I hope you find it worth the effort because I know that summer period, at least in our side, is a tight period with the agenda, many things that you cannot do or deadlines to meet before the summer break. So yeah, at least I hope if you save time for this, you'll you find it worth it, okay? Um, yeah, the, I'm just going to show some slides to, to make everyone acquainted of what this is going on. So the webinar is organized between uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, CSE and CMT, Portmotores Thermicos from UPD. And uh, it's within the context, as you saw in the invitation, of a collaborative effort between Europe and Mexico in terms of an H2020 project called Enersico. So we intend to, to in this project, we are uh, pretending to, to uh, uh, use or improve exascale high performance tools for uh, uh, energy uh, industry, in particular for oil, gas, wind energy, and renewable fuel combustion. So we, we have linked this uh, webinar to the activities in ICE applications. That's why the talks would be on IC engines and applications. Uh, so and our, our uh, the people involved in this um, in this uh, activity will be all experts from from the IC world. So the keywords will be HPC, renewable fuels, and ICEs. And, and the idea is to provide some dissemination of technical information, and that's for what the, that's related to the first three talks we'll hear. And second, we'll open a discussion about uh, the, the world related to these uh, three keywords uh, in current technological context, and that's what the roundtable will be for. So the agenda and, and, uh, is shown here on this slide. We'll have three talks from, by Daniel Mira, one by Musin Amen, and why, one by Carmen Fang. Uh, each of them will be around 20, 25 minutes plus some time for questions. And after that, we have a roundtable discussion that we moderated by Daniel Mira, and where we will additionally have Gil Hardy, Federico Milo, uh, as uh, also uh, uh, participants. Just to finish, um, you will obviously are encouraged to participate. And for that, there will be a clear turn at the presentation. So after the presentation, or maybe during you can, you can write uh, the questions and answer, and answer part of the chat. Um, but we'll, we'll try to address them at the end of each presentation. And then during the round table discussions, you, you are also welcome to participate via the same, the same tools that are available on this. Uh, uh, Zoom platform, or even raise your hand, and maybe at some point we can give you the word. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Very much. So we're going to hear the second speech by Musin Namen. I hope you can hear me, Musin. Yeah, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, sure. So I'd like to just make a small introduction. So Musin Amen is a research scientist in the Center for Transportation Research in Argonne's Energy Systems Division. He has more than 10 years of experience in turbulent reacting flows, high order numerical methods, and high performance computing. He's currently leading the development of NEC 5000, a high order spectral elemental code to perform scalable simulations on internal combustion engine on upcoming exascale computing platforms. So Musin, the floor is yours, so All right. you can start. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jose. Uh, and uh, thank you again for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, so yeah, like Jose said, my name is Mohsen Amin. Uh, I'm a research scientist at the Energy Systems Division at Argonne National Lab. So my presentation is going to be slightly different from the other talks, as in it's not going to be focusing specifically on uh, low carbon or renewable fuels, but more from an engine simulation standpoint. 
And hopefully whatever I show here can also be applied towards these low carbon and renewable fuels as that seems to be the direction uh, that we're going uh, towards. Uh, and again, my, the title of my talk is uh, DNS and high fidelity LES for uh, improved prediction of in-cylinder flow and combustion process. Uh, so just a quick motivation. I don't think this is really required uh, for this audience, but uh, again, uh, the image on the right uh, shows the energy outlook uh, that's from uh, 2019 IEA outlook, and it's uh, from uh, it's it seems that you know even uh, as as we move towards electrification, there seems to be gasoline and diesel-based engines will still play a, a bigger role. And again, these uh, timelines may adjust based on how how the different uh, governments would uh, change their strategies. But improving IC engine efficiency is uh, is a critical element of a path towards lower petroleum consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. And again, on top of that, as we move towards low carbon and renewable fuels, this would provide an, another uh, straightforward path towards improving uh, energy efficiency. So uh, the remaining technical challenges uh, from uh, to to achieve these objectives is. Uh, uh, to improve understanding and ability to manipulate the combustion process in these engines, improve understanding of how fuel properties uh, impact the efficiency of modern engines, and also to develop predictive simulation tools that can help optimize, optimize engine designs faster. And I'm, my talk is going to be focusing more on this specific part, as in how, we, like at Argon, how we are uh, trying to develop predictive simulation tools and how that can help the industry achieve these objectives faster. Uh, and again, this is also going to be very familiar to the audience here. We all know that simulating internal combustion engines is very challenging. Uh, we have a lot of physics happening, including uh, multi-phase flows. And again, Daniel gave a very nice talk of how uh, his or his group is using these high fidelity simulations to look at two-phase engine, uh, two-phase flows. But in engines, in addition to two-phase flows, you have all modes of heat transfer. Basically, you have turbulent heat transfer inside the uh, inside the combustion chamber. You have conjugate heat transfer uh, through the engine walls. Additionally, you have combustion chemistry for different fuels, turbulent reacting flows, material issues, and so forth. Uh, and also, you have to take into account moving boundaries, where uh, it has been shown that having grid convergence simulations is very challenging. Additionally, if you look at the length scales in an internal combustion engine flow, you have uh, in terms of length scales, it can go all the way from five microns for droplets to 100 millimeter when you're considering the bulk flows. And similarly for time scales also, there's a large range. So basically the, the simulations are, if you want a fully predictive simulation for these, uh, for these systems, it is in fact very challenging. So the approach that we have been taking at Argon is to use a multi-fidelity simulation framework where we use simulations ranging across the length, across the scales. So uh, at the highest or at the most detail level, we try to perform direct numerical simulations for a few different engine platforms that a few different specific operating conditions. And I will talk a little bit about one of those conditions uh, in a later slide. Again, the objective here is not to use DNS to uh, optimize or develop engines, but to basically generate some gold standard data sets that can complement the experimental data sets. And uh, in the middle, we have uh, these multi-cycle multi wall resolved LES calculations. Again, these are also pretty expensive, but it's it's definitely more feasible than the DNS. And here the uh, grid sizes could range from 0.1 to 0.5 millimeter. And we typically run these on a few thousands of process. And on the uh, extreme low end, uh, you have this high throughput design space exploration, which should be performed using uh, sp most mostly using RANs or engineering LES level calculations. So here, each simulations are going to be very cheap. You can run it on uh, up to 100 process, but the objective is then to kind of group them together uh, and to try to cover the whole design space. And with, with, within the last few years, there's also been a, a lot of focus on developing reduced order models uh, that can basically run on the fly. And uh, simulations from all these different regimes can, can kind of be used together to, uh, to generate these uh, surrogate models. And again, there's a lot of work on surrogate model at our group, but I'm not gonna be talking much about this. So in this talk, I'll be kind of focusing on these two, uh, these two processes. Uh, and again, just a little bit about the, the 
project that's supporting this work. So we are part of what is called as space, uh, which is supported by uh, Department of Energy's Vehicle Technologies Office. So PACE stands for part is a Partnership to Advance Combustion Engines, and it's a partnership among uh, five to six different national labs across the US. And here the objective is to combine unique experiments and world-class DOE computing and machine learning expertise to speed discovery of knowledge, improve engine design tools, and enable uh, market competitive powertrain solutions. And in our specific project, uh, we are trying to develop this code called NEC 5000, like uh, Jose mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so the objective here is to uh, have this open source, massively parallel, high order code that has capabilities to model in cylinder engine flows. A specific objectives, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today, is to adapt, uh, to show what we did to adapt this code uh, to a scalable simulation tool for ice engine simulations, and then to perform multi-cycle high fidelity Walders or alias to look at a phenomena called cyclic variability. And uh, finally, to perform DNS of the compression and expansion strokes, and to look at uh, look at evaluating the accuracy of currently available wall models and uh, and find ways to improve these wall models. Okay, so the simulation approach uh, we use this tool called NEC 5000. Uh, it is based on the spectral element method based discretization. The spectral element method is like finite element method. Uh, you discretize your uh, simulation domain into different discrete elements. And within each element, you use a high order polynomial, uh, tensor, tensor product polynomial interpolation. And typically for our simulations, we use anywhere between five and 10. Uh, the advantage of these uh, approaches is that you get exponential or spectral convergence by changing the polynomial order. And these codes have also been shown to be highly scalable and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, I'll skip over some of these details. So some of the specific uh, unique features are that uh, in addition to being high order, it can also handle complex geometries and also moving boundaries. So this is just a, a snapshot of, of the mesh uh, as it's being deformed during a compression stroke for, for a four wall uh, pen roof uh, engine. Uh, and uh, we typically use third party software to generate these meshes, which are generated a priori. And typically during one simulation, we use around 30 different meshes. And there is a high order grid to grid interpolation utility that, that can help you move from one mesh to the other without any loss of accuracy. And like I said, this this uh, this code has been shown to be highly scalable. So this is just for an engine simulation with uh, moving geometry and everything. So we were able to, uh, for this uh, Walders or LES calculation, we were able to uh, scale up to around 30,000 process. And for DNS calculations, we show scalability on more than 50,000 process. And there's also a GPU version, which is under development. And I'll talk a little bit about it at the very end. So the first part of the talk is going to be looking at uh, performing multi-cycle wall dissolve LES uh, to understand this phenomena called cyclic variability. All right, so uh, we'll just, uh, yeah. So for people who are not aware of it, so cycle to cycle variability is something that's very common in spark ignition engines. Uh, so the idea here is that when you run the same engine for multiple cycles, you can have uh, the cylinder combustion processes can change quite a lot from one cycle to the next. And again, this uh, under dilute operation and LTC combustion modes, these, the CCV can become uh, even larger. And uh, so as, as your uh, CCV increases, that can limit the thermal efficiency, increase pollutant in emissions, and also lead to unstable operations. And there's been several reasons that have been uh, hypothesized for CCV, including the variability in the flow field near the spark plug, variability in the fuel vapor distribution, turbulence and density, spray structure, spark discharge characteristics. So our objective is to uh, perform high fidelity simulations uh, to kind of investigate the effects of these factors. And again, th this image, this is from, uh, from an experiment from GM, where basically they're showing the, 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 the location of the initial flame kernel uh, for different cycles. So you can see that from cycle to cycle, the initial flame kernel growth can kind of change drastically, so even changing in direction. And typically, again, like I said, under some conditions, this can actually lead to a larger variations in the insulin pressures at, at later times. Uh, so for our simulations, we have been using this platform. Uh, so for some of you might be aware, this is called a GM uh, TCC3 engine. Uh, so this is, an, uh, this is a two valve, so basically one intake valve, one exhaust valve, uh, full optical engine. Uh, experiments were performed at University of Michigan. Uh, and the reason for choosing this platform was this, this is a pretty simple platform. 
which was easy to mesh and it, it, it also has uh, full optical access. So there is optical access for X, Y, and Z planes uh, and across several crank angles. Uh, so we uh, started with the wall resolved LES calculation. So some details of the meshes are shown here. So we have around 30 to 100 million grid points uh, with minimum grid size of around 15 micron. And these simulations were performed on Argon's uh, Theta supercomputer. We ran uh, these on around 16,000 process. Uh, so this video kind of shows for one full cycle how the insulin flow field evolves. So again, during the intake stroke, you have this high velocity intake jet coming in. We do see some initial interaction of this intake jet with spark plug, which I will talk in a little bit. Uh, again, during compression, uh, uh, the valve is closed. We kind of switched the visualization now to show the insulin temperature. One thing that is kind of sh uh, shown clearly is as, as you increase compression, you start seeing more and more smaller scale structures. So this is because your uh, insulin Reynolds number increases with increasing uh, compression, which leads to appearance of large, uh, smaller scales. Again, during expansion, these smaller scales dissipate and kind of start seeing more larger scales. And again, during exhaust, I'm kind of changing the visualization back to uh, the flow field and also showing the Lambda 2 uh, vortices as, as it gets pushed out uh, uh, through the exhaust port. And the objective for uh, for this uh, the study was to investigate the cylinder flow structures that that have an immediate impact on uh, cyclic variability. Uh, so before doing that, just showing some direct comparison between uh, the cylinder velocity magnitude. So this is just a plane. Uh, the location of the plane is shown here. It's showing the structure of this intake jet for three different cycles from LES as well as uh, from PIV measurements. So overall, we do see that both uh, LES and the simulation uh, and the measurements show uh, similar uh, variations in the structure of the intake jet. So you can kind of see the length or the penetration of the intake jet can change from cycle to cycle. And also the orientation of the jet can change from cycle to cycle. And both the simulations and PIV kind of show a similar behavior. And we, can, we did a, a more thorough validation by comparing the statistics so again here we had around uh, 12 cycles for, for these simulations. Again, these simulations are pretty expensive. We, we would have liked to run around 20, 25 cycles, uh, but we were only able to run uh, up to 20 cycles. So here the statistics were based on uh, just 11 cycles after removing the first few cycles. So overall, we do see that the means uh, agree pretty well. The RMSs also, at least near the intake jet, agrees well. We expect the downstream uh, downstream agreement to get better with more cycles. And again, more quantitative validations are shown here. This is just across a line passing through this intake jet. So overall, we do see that uh, the simulations are agreeing pretty well, especially for the RMS. We were very happy from our previous uh, work with, uh, with, with some engineering LAS calculations. We always saw that the means were predicted well, but RMSs were always underpredicted, especially at the intake jet exit or in, uh, the exit of the intake valve. Even with more cycles, we, we never kind of reached these high levels. So uh, this was very encouraging. And this is again a comparison during the compression stroke. So overall, we, we are pretty happy with uh, the agreement between the simulations and the experiments. Uh, so we also looked at the large and small scale uh, flow features. So this is kind of showing the, the swirl ratio. Uh, over here and the two, the, the X and Y tumble ratios uh, for, for different cycles. So uh, if you look at the Y tumble, it shows uh, pretty low cyclic variability across the five cycles with some variability, especially uh, during the early intake and also when the intake valve is completely open. Uh, looking at the tumble structures, we do see that uh, in, in particular, when the jet impinches on the piston surface, that's kind of where uh, we see the largest variability. And there's also like a sustained tumble motion that's seen uh, right after the intake valve is closed. Uh, for the X tumble, there's much more variability again during this early intake and early exhaust. Uh, and for the swirl ratio, uh, again, we don't see too much variability. All the cycles behave pretty similarly across uh, the different cycles. Uh, but there is, there is some variability. Again, this is something we're kind of looking into in more detail now. Uh, we also looked at energy distribution across the flow scales. Uh, so the multi-cycle LES data set can uh, provide info not just on the large scale structures, but also on the, the energy distribution across the scale. So basically how the energy is distributed across the large, intermediate, and the small scales. So what we did was uh, 
uh, we performed a 1D FFT of uh, across different planes. So, so for this specific uh, slide, I'm going to show uh, FFT on an XY plane right below the spark plug. We saw that the turbulence was pretty close to isotropic, especially uh, in, during the compression stroke uh, in, in these planes. So 1D FFT seems like a justified approach to look at the energy distribution. Uh, so this is kind of showing how the energy uh, distribution in the, the X direction and in the Y direction for three different crank angles. So here, uh, as we go from, uh, so basically the blue is at a uh, crank angle of 260. So we're basically looking at how the energy is distributed as, as the piston moves up. So we do see that uh, with, with increasing compression, we see that the energy distribution change uh, increases across all the length scales, which is, which is expected. So you are kind of giving, uh, putting more energy into the flow by compressing uh, compressing the flow. We also uh, uh, see that uh, the difference between uh, the 300 and 340 is much larger than the difference between 260 and 300. And this corresponds to this tumble breakdown that was shown in the last slide. So around 300 is where you have this uh, the tumble Y changing direction or reaching a peak and uh, there is a tumble breakdown. And that leads to formation of more energy in the smaller scale. So this was something interesting. Uh, we also looked at this phenomena where, uh, from our simulations, we saw that uh, when the intake jet impinged the spark plug, that lead, led to formation of a lot of small scale structures, which we thought could have an impact on CCD. Uh, so there was a question from industry saying whether is this something important to look into? Is, is this interaction something that can uh, impact CCD? So to look at that, we performed some additional simulations for, uh, for LES without a spark plug. Uh, so here is kind of showing some uh, initial uh, comparison of the intake jet structure bit with and without spark plug. So overall, we, we don't see too much difference near the spark plug, but we, you can kind of see that the boundary layer at the piston surface kind of uh, is heavily impacted by the spark plug. So because of this interaction, the boundary layer development is much, much slower uh, for the spark plug case compared to the no spark plug case. And we also uh, kind of compared the large scale flow structures uh, between the two cases. So what we saw was that uh, for the swirl ratio, the mean and CCV are not affected significantly by the presence of the spark plug. Whereas for the tumble ratio, we see a pretty large uh, difference in the early intake stroke. And this was kind of uh, what we expected. So because of this impingement, uh, you know, uh, with the spark plug, you kind of see a reduction in tumble ratio, whereas without spark plug, you don't see that. So overall, we, we see some early differences in the early uh, development, but these differences do not persist at later crank angles. Okay, so, so my last part of the talk, uh, hopefully I'll, I can finish in the next six to seven minutes. Uh, to, uh, the objective here is to develop improved uh, wall models using uh, direct numerical simulations. Uh, so again, just a quick overview. So in multidimensional engine simulations, uh, typically wall result simulations are too expensive and we have to uh, resort to using wall models. So here we are not resolving the boundary layers, but we are using uh, wall models, which will basically uh, give you a prediction of the wall shear stress and wall heat transfer that that uh, that needs to be given as a boundary condition for, for your uh, for your governing equations. So there are several approaches. The most common approach is uh, using wall function models. So here uh, we kind of use experimental or previous DNS data for uh, uh, channel flows or, uh, or similar uh, simple configurations and use the results from those simulations to, uh, to impose these wall functions, which will predict the wall shear stress. And the more, uh, the more complicated or more uh, expensive approaches to use what is called as non-equilibrium wall models where, where we solve a, uh, solve a separate set of equations in an embedded region near the walls. Uh, so the approach we, have, we are performing here is, is to perform a fully resolved DNS for some part of the engine cycle and to use that data set to assess the validity of commonly used wall function models and also to try to improve the accuracy of these models. Uh, so we again use the same platform. Uh, again, like I said, during uh, during compression expansion, uh, the simulations are, it is feasible to run DNS. So we basically just uh, generated a final grid with uh, with careful estimation of the grid sizes so that it resolves all the, all the relevant scales across this compression expansion stroke. So here we have around uh, 300 to 400 million grid points. 
Uh, the minimum grid size was around nine microns, and we ran these on a larger number of processes. So again, these simulations typically take around two days to just run uh, the compression expansion on, on 50,000 processes. And this is kind of showing the scales as, as it evolves. And I'll go, go through this quickly because I think I'm kind of running out of time now. Uh, so the first thing we did was uh, for this engine platform at 500 RPM, there was some experimental data available for heat flux uh, at a specific point on the uh, on the cylinder head. Uh, so here is the comparison between the ex experimental heat flux and the DNS heat flux. So overall, we do see a pretty good agreement uh, between the two cases. And again, we did not use conjugate heat transfer for for our simulation. So that could lead to some uh, discrepancy in this uh, in the comparison, but overall we are pretty happy with the with the uh, uh, with the uh, comparison between simulations and experiment. Uh, and this is kind of looking at the near wall flow field. So this is very small window, five millimeter by uh, four millimeter, just near uh, near the pist or near the cylinder head surface. Uh, so overall, uh, we see a similar uh, kind of qualitatively similar uh, flow structures between the DNS and the PIV. Overall, we'll need much more DNS realizations to do a proper validation. Again, that is not uh, that is not uh, feasible uh, because it's too expensive at this point. Uh, I'll skip over this. Uh, so again, uh, from these simulations, we were able to kind of look at variations in velocity at three points in the engine cycle. Uh, so overall, this is kind of looking at a point near the spark plug, uh, somewhere in the middle, and somewhere near the wall. So what we see is that near the spark plug, uh, you have much uh, small or much larger frequency of oscillations, and this is kind of this this frequency also uh, corresponded to the vortex shedding frequency that we observed due to this intake jet spark plug uh, interaction. And near the walls, the fluctuation time scales are much uh, longer, and these corresponded to typical boundary layer separation frequencies. Uh, the first step was to evaluate the accuracy of available wall models. Uh, so this is uh, looking at, uh, we, we, we uh, kind of use the DNS data to perform an a priori analysis of, of, the, uh, of, the, of, uh, of a few different wall models. Uh, so on the left here is uh, Reichert model and Werner and Wenkel model. Uh, both are very commonly used for momentum wall, uh, wall models. And on the right, it's uh, two different heat transfer models are, are shown here. Uh, and uh, so overall, uh, what you see is that uh, for none of the wall models are able to perform uh, well enough. And again, this is quantitatively shown here. Basically, I'm showing the error in predicting the shear stress as a function of near wall grid sizes. Again, if you have grid sizes below 0.25 millimeter, the errors are kind of within plus or minus 10 percent. But with typical grid size of around 0.5 to 1 millimeter, the errors are above uh, what is expected. And similarly for the heat transfer models as well, that's what you see. Uh, and uh, we kind of used uh, a simple approach to try to improve the wall model performance. Uh, so again, this was an initial approach. We are doing a little bit more carefully or uh, more thorough uh, validation or more thorough analysis right now, but some initial results shown here. So this is, we basically picked this Reichert model. So this is the current formulation. So we kind of parameterize that using two parameters, kappa and A, and kind of uh, varied the kappa and A across a whole range of uh, uh, conditions. And uh, we, we are looking at the error in shear stress across these uh, three different or two different RPMs and two different crank angles. So what we see is that by, uh, by shifting from this uh, original uh, values for these parameters, by optimizing this, we are able to kind of get within plus or minus 10% error across these uh, whole range of conditions. And this is shown quantitatively here as well. So by using the default model, again, we need around 0.25 millimeter to get within this plus or minus 10%. But with this optimal model, even with grid size of around 0.6 to 1 millimeter, you're kind of within uh, expected error norms. And we can kind of do a similar thing for the heat transfer model as well. Uh, again, I'll skip through this, but I can definitely talk about this if you have time during the question Q and A. Uh, so again, we kind of uh, start with one one specific heat transfer model, and we did this parameter uh, optimization, and we kind of see that we are able to go from uh, above plus or minus thirty percent error to within this plus or minus thirty percent error band uh, by tuning this parameter. So I'm getting to the last few slides. So uh, one thing is, again, uh, as we move towards uh, exascale platforms, 
uh, one thing that's clear is that at least within the US, US computing platforms, uh, all the future leadership supercomputers will be heterogeneous. Uh, so basically we'll have CPU and GPU. So everything that uh, we're planning towards the future needs to uh, take this into account. And with that in mind, a couple of years back, we have kind of shifted towards this GPU accelerated uh, implementation of NEC called NEC RS. Uh, so currently we have already uh, ported our engine simulation platform or engine simulation capability into this platform. Uh, our spray and combustion models has still not been ported into this GPU framework yet, but that's currently underway. And uh, again, for the Lagrangian solution, we're kind of using this uh, library called Copa Kana. All right, so uh, coming to the summary, uh, basically our work uh, over the last few years has been to kind of develop this uh, easy to use open source framework uh, that industry, academia, and national lab researchers can leverage for uh, model development. Uh, and in this, in this presentation, I showed some work uh, for two, two different works uh, conducted as part of this work. Uh, one was this multi-cycle LES uh, for this GM TCC3 engine. Uh, to look at the effects or look at the causes of cyclic variability. Uh, so overall, we see that we are uh, able to agree pretty well with the PIV measurements. And also we're doing further analysis to investigate costs of CCV. And in the second part, I showed uh, this DNS work on how uh, we can use these simulations to develop improved wall models. And again, uh, the work that's currently happening in our group is uh, we are kind of moved to uh, fired, fired engine operating conditions. And here, now we are interested in looking uh, flame wall interaction. That seems to be something uh, that we are struggling with in, in uh, with the currently available models. And again, uh, although I showed this very simple engine platform, uh, recently we have also moved to more realistic engine geometry. So this is a four valve uh, DISI engine for which there's external data from Santia National Lab. And we also kind of moved towards this LES and DNS of fired engine operation. Uh, and again, uh, in the near future, it looks like everything is kind of moving towards, uh, you know, moving away from fossil fuels and moving towards low carbon and renewable fuels. So our hope is that whatever work we put in here can also be used uh, to explore feasibility of low carbon fuels. So that's kind of, uh, we feel that's the direction this going. And uh, yeah, before I conclude, I would like to thank our DOE sponsors, uh, Argon team, uh, I won't, name everyone, but I'll just probably keep the slide here uh, as, as I answer the questions. But thanks, thanks again for the time. I hope I didn't go too over with the time. Thanks, Masin. Um, thanks for the interesting presentation. Again, uh, I, I would invite uh, the audience to put questions on the Q&A or simply raise the hand so that I can I can give you the word open your microphone for you to answer directly. Okay, there is already one question from Anurag Surapaneni. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, you can read that aloud. If okay. You want. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, was a statistical study done with the PIV data between cycles? If yes, how many cycles does it take to have statistical inference? Uh, that's a very good question. So we, uh, in the beginning, before moving into this NEC, uh, NEC 5000 uh, simulations, we actually ran a bunch of engineering LES simulations. Uh, and I have a few papers I can share with you. So what we have seen, uh, it can change quite a lot from engine platform to platform and also from engine operating condition to engine operating condition. For motor conditions, typically around 20 cycles is enough. If you're just interested in uh, just statistics of the flow field, but if you're interested in statistics of combustion, uh, typically would need around 25 to 30 cycles. Again, depending on the operating conditions. So uh, if you go to like dilute and LTC conditions, it may we may need more. And actually, there was a study we did uh, in collaborations collaboration with Federico Prof, Prof, Professor Federico Milo. He's also in the call and kind of looked at some different approaches. So again problem with these uh, CCV simulations is that you have to run these multiple cycles one after the other. So we explored this possibility of splitting that into multiple smaller simulations. And uh, we find that's an interesting way of doing it. As it's valid for some conditions. Again, for some conditions, you cannot really do that because there's a lot of feedback effect from one cycle to the next. But under some conditions, you can kind of do that. I, I hope that answers the question. But yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you have further thoughts on that. Um, I don't know, maybe if I can, yeah. 
So if you want, I would like to ask something else. I I I, I made you have a, a, your uh, microphone available. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think it answered my question. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Lucas. Okay. Good. Uh, any other answer from the audience? Uh, a question for the audience? Sorry, not yet. I have one uh, question. So, what's the strategy? You mentioned that you intend to move to combustion conditions. So, uh, for for the upcoming DNS calculations, so which will be the main goal? I, I guess this is a sort of a spark ignition type engine. Yeah. So, uh, Are you yeah. Thinking of a conventional spark ignition operating condition or some some more uh, elaborated combustion strategy. Yeah, so this project is part of the space program where uh, the focus was on conventional light duty uh, engines. So our current plan is, uh, again, this would be SI engines. Uh, the idea is to use these simulations to develop uh, improved submodels. Again, we uh, for, for the motor conditions, we were able to run a full compression stroke, but for fire, that's definitely not possible. So the idea is to kind of uh, perform wall resolve LES for part of the cycle, basically from okay. the ignition towards maybe like uh, when, once the flame reaches close to the wall, we freeze the f uh, flow and then kind of use that to map it to this DNS uh, okay. mesh and kind of run in a short, short burst. So maybe like 10 crank angles of DNS. That's the only thing which is going to be feasible. But uh, again, the current plan is to use it for uh, conventional light duty, but we have some internal projects kind of starting to look into alternate fuels, but we currently have no, uh, you know, fully funded or fully supported work on uh, renewable fuels with this NEC platform. But we have some other projects, but I don't have I, time. To I guess time will come when you can use these renewable fuels. So. Yeah, that's our hope. Yeah. So again, uh, I mean, I'm a computational scientist. I kind of like, you know, making this tool that can work and hopefully it can work for conditions that are of relevance too. Okay, great. So yeah, I think we are, uh, we are going to close the discussion here. Uh, there is also that, oh, I think Danny, Daniel has, has an answer, has some questions, yes? Uh, yes, I, I just have one quick question. So thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It was very interesting. So can you comment a bit more on, so you, you were showing some results of a uh, standard world models that uh, were not able to reproduce, uh, especially the heat flux, as I could see, and also the the skin friction. I don't know if you show skin friction. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, yeah, yeah, the shear velocity, which is basically kind of, you know, close to the shear, shear stress, yeah. And, and, and then the question is, you said that uh, you, so the next, uh, so now you demonstrated with equilibrium models were not uh, working as expected. So you said moving to non-equilibrium models. So, yeah. so the question is, um, so are you uh, considering the possibility to use uh, machine learning to optimize uh, parameter constants or more simple models that do not go into the direction of non-equilibrium models, or you you think that non-equilibrium models could be just the best uh, shot for this problem? Yeah, no, it's a very good good point. Again, this slide was kind of you know I kind of reused the slide from last year, but in the last one year we had a, we have a, a again another uh, a kind of a collaboration project between uh, us and another industry partner where we are specifically looking at this uh, ML-driven uh, heat transfer model. Again, that. That specific project was more geared towards gas turbine applications, uh, but our hope is that you know these simulations can also be used for uh, developing ML driven models. Again, I didn't have time to go into machine learning stuff, but maybe that's something we can discuss during roundtable. That's yeah. definitely something we are all very interested in. And, and yeah, probably. there's been some promise with the early work, but again, with machine learning, it's it's all too early. So. Uh, we, can, we hope that it, it works like, you know, it's promised to work, but uh, mm -hmm. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for Chris. Okay, Masin. So thanks again for the meeting. And now I give the word to Daniel, who will be in charge of moderating the discussion. Okay, thank you, Jose Maria. So now you will be part of the round table. So now, as Jose Maria explained, now we move to the round table. Uh, we have ahead a very interesting discussion with a high level uh, panel. 
uh, with different uh, expertise in the area of uh, internal uh, combustion engines. So let me introduce the panel members. I, I understand that uh, Dr. Carr uh, will be leaving soon, so please do so when, whenever you, you're ready. Uh, the other uh, presenter uh, will be uh, in the round table, uh, will be uh, Mushin Amen that was introduced uh, first in the presentation. Uh, then let me just uh, introduce the rest of the presenters. Uh, Professor Jose Maria Garcia Oliver, uh, is a full professor at the CMT Motores Thermicos Institute at the University Universidad Politecnica de Valencia. He has been uh, working in uh, simulation and experiments uh, on complex physical and chemical phenomena in combustion systems. Uh, Maria has been uh, working specifically more on spray processes using optical diagnostics and also 1D and CFD. Um, the other uh, present, uh, the other panel member is uh, Gilles Hardy. is a senior thermodynamic engineer at FFT Motor and for Sham in Arbonne in Switzerland. Sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, he has been a, a long experience in, 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 the, in the field of uh, internal combustion engines. He has been uh, more recently uh, working on heavy duty uh, combustion models uh, for flame wall interactions, higher uh, compression ratio and uh, uh, NOx and CO2 uh, uh, predictions. Uh, he's been a lead engineer of uh, many projects uh, related to uh, exhaust gas recirculations and also uh, on optimization on heavy duty engines uh, with the new fuels, the methyl ethers, for instance, and also on hydrogen uh, application for internal combustion engines and uh, other activities. So we thank you, Gilles, for the, your participation. Uh, the uh, last uh, member of the roundtable is uh, Professor Federico Millo, who is a professor uh, on automotive and internal combustion engines at the Politecnico di Torino in, in Italy. Uh, he has been uh, working on, the, on this research field uh, from 1999, and he has published more than 150 articles and uh, mainly focus on internal combustion engines and hybrid powertrains. He uh, has long experience also in coordination of uh, research projects with uh, General Motors, FCA, Honda, and Ferrari. And uh, from 2016, he was uh, recognized at the SAI Fellow uh, for his contribution in the field of internal combustion engines and energy uh, management in hybrid uh, vehicles. So we thank you all uh, very much for the participation uh, in the round table. Uh, we have prepared uh, this session uh, with uh, some questions that uh, are going from uh, more specific and from fundamentals about internal combustion engines to more, uh, let's say, open questions uh, that come by the use of uh, internal combustion engines in the, in, in for, for automotive application. In the, current, uh, in, in the current situation where uh, internal combustion engines seems to be shifted uh, to uh, electric uh, vehicles. So we would like to discuss this a little bit uh, at the end. So let's say, the, let me just start uh, with uh, some questions uh, about uh, the use of uh, modeling and simulation for the prediction of uh, uh, physical processes in internal combustion engines. So we talked about a lot in, uh, in our project about the use of exascale computing and high performance computing and how these uh, um, techniques uh, can contribute uh, to the development of internal combustion engines and other combustion systems. And uh, now uh, we are facing uh, an, a, a real interest in the use of uh, new fuels. So this is a, just a general question to open the discussion uh, about uh, what do you think, uh, how uh, high performance computing and exascale computing can be, uh, benefit the, the integration of new fuels in internal combustion engines. So let me just uh, ask the first question to Jose Maria Garcia, and then I will just uh, repeat the same question for all of you, and then uh, we will just uh, go on uh, from there. Okay, so thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, I guess the, from from uh, and you, you just briefly mentioned so there is a lot of pressure 
on the industry or when developing new internal combustion engines for 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 f different fulfillment so pollutants efficiency nowadays these these new fuels that have to be, to be used to decarbonize and i guess obviously the the computational tools are much uh, faster way to 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 improve designs and for some uh, in, in practice even i would say they are essential for the development for, for, for the prediction of mm, uh, pollutants especially which is really critical so i guess uh, when, when we have these exascale approaches if we eventually manage to go up and to the different steps of, of the processes happening there so up to pollutant emissions i guess uh, the, the role is again improving the this this the accuracy of the modeling to to lead to new to better better engine designs i guess uh, the, the like you know that should for example which is one particularly complex pollutant needs plenty of details at all the steps from injection, atomization, mixing. And as long as we have better models, you know, an exascale should allow to, to do the best possible models nowadays to put them on the table for the industry. I guess they can contribute to, 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 to improve the engine designs, especially because again, of the phase of these new fuels, which are changing a bit of the, let's say that was sort of the last Thing that wasn't re relatively stable in the engine development history, I would say. So, yeah, I think that's that's a, a, from my point of view, emissions are a key parameter to be performed, and that's the 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 point where where exascale and all this advanced uh, computing has to to help. Okay. 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 Thank you, Jose Maria. So the the same question uh, for for Gills, can you can you give us your thoughts on on this and if exascale is going to make a difference in internal combustion engine. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for your question. Um, well, I'm, work I'm working in the other scale of this environment, in industrial uh, environment. And of course, uh, exascale, I see this is quite interesting, but in terms of cost, uh, I think only few big, large OEM from the car industry could afford this. But as I work here more in a heavy duty truck and heavy duty heavy duty off road application uh, directly i don't think it's possible especially since the internal combustion engine are, are being heavily tread by fuel cell technologies and um, and, uh, and electric propulsion on the other hand i think this investigation done on dns and ELS allows to further improve maybe some modeling uh, from runs from flame wool interaction or from um, uh, from i mean any wool models this is welcome but i think that even at my position the invest any uh, computation will be done any engineering any optimization will be always done with uh, runs based software because we don't have the possibility to run uh, even something like 1000 cpu no, I think that uh, renew this new renewable fuel or this new fuel, like, uh, well, I'm working intensively with DME. I think there's still a lot of things to be understood from this fuel. And uh, where maybe CFD could bring something uh, or this exascale is blending, for example, blending of DME and, um, and propane uh as an alternative fuel uh, that could be interesting to understand what's happened you know i mean this is of course it's very difficult to evaluate with runs in my opinion so there you we could push the boundary to more sophisticated code um in general that's what i have to say but uh exascale i think will remain more at an academic level or research level like argon and you know maybe you have to feed the industry or um run software with 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 improved model in general okay so you in your opinion is more of for fundamental studies rather than yeah. for design purposes right yeah yeah okay uh, so then uh, federico um what's uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, based on your experience uh, yes thank you. Uh, daniel good afternoon uh, everyone uh, yes, uh, I think Gilles uh, has uh, raised uh, a, a much more fundamental question in his answer, that is, does it still make sense uh, 
plan uh, this huge kind of investment uh, that are necessary for uh, exact scale computing in a world uh, that uh, seems to uh, discard uh, any kind of uh, research uh, focusing on internal combustion engine that are seen as the new evil <laughs> in uh, most of uh, application. But uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, the, the problem uh, is not the internal combustion engine itself. The problem is the fuel uh, uh, that uh, we have to uh, develop. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the development of uh, renewable fuel uh, in the new uh, generation of e-fuel can uh, uh, significantly contribute to reach our target in terms of uh, uh, lowering pollutant emission and uh, uh, achieving the goal of uh, uh, zero CO2 uh, emission in the, in the future. So I think it is uh, uh, mandatory to uh, exploit uh, all the option and uh, uh, with this uh, <clears throat> perspective in the approach for sure uh, high performance computing can pave the way for uh, new approaches uh, that uh, has been uh, so far uh, limited uh, to uh, more fundamental studies, as uh, she was mentioning, uh, more uh, academic and fundamental research. But uh, for instance, if we think uh, about the, the um, opportunities that can be uh, provided if we uh, are able to uh, or are allowed by high uh, performance computing to make a change of paradigm, to move from the traditionally runs based approach aiming to uh, reproduce an average cycle to uh, a, an LES uh, approach capable to capture the, the feature uh, of uh, 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 cycle to cycle variability that can be extremely interesting, especially if we uh, try to exploit new combustion mode, new fuels, uh, ultra lean mixture and uh, uh, topics like that. So I, I uh, <clears throat> am quite uh, uh, optimistic on uh, the opportunities uh, that uh, can be provided uh, in the future uh, for the engine community. Uh, obviously, if we manage to survive as an engine community. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Mushim, can you comment on this as well? And Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, so basically, the way I see it, uh, moving towards exascale, even being at a national lab, we still have to compete with a lot of researchers to get computing time on these uh, on these machines. And with uh, the way you know the focus on combustion is moving forward, we feel like it may get even more challenging moving forward to get computing time. Uh, so in terms of applications that that can run on these machines, so I, I agree with a lot of the points that were mentioned before. So we don't we don't expect you know these exascale machines to be used directly for you know the direct device level engine optimization study for example the way we see it like like i showed in my presentation i feel like the best way of using it is to kind of as a group decide on a few really important processes that really or different submodels that really need improvement and kind of have targeted simulations for you know, the specific process and try to use this data. And again, like I talked about, or during the discussion, like Daniel asked about, you know, machine learning models, right? So I think these large scale simulations can really uh, provide a lot of training data that can be used for uh, for these machine learning uh, based models. So in terms of like uh, engine simulations uh, on these exascale platform, at least in the machines that we have at Argon, Typically for these large allocations, we need to show that we are able to use up like 20% of the machine for one simulation. So if you're not able to show that they won't give us like large computing resources. So typically I see engine 
simulations can never kind of completely use up these large number of processes. So we typically, what we do is kind of have ensemble calculations. So we're, you know, you can kind of uh, bundle together like thousands of smaller hundred process simulations together into one ensemble job. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. So we have worked with a few in, uh, automotive industries to kind of use these supercomputers for such ensemble calculations. It's still a little bit tricky uh, because each simulation should kind of take approximately the same amount of time. If not, there's a lot of problems kind of managing these jobs and whatnot. One other uh, application where exascale machines could be used is in uh, fuel chemistry. So the chemistry folks at Argon uh, use these supercomputers quite a lot for performing these first principle based uh, kind of DFT atomistic level simulations to generate these chemical kinetics, uh, you know, tables. So I think that's one place where it's pretty scalable, you know, as we move towards these kind of uh, multi-component fuels uh, or multi-component approximations of real fuels. I think you know these tools could really help in generating these uh, fuel chemistry. So that's definitely one place where exascale can really help. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you all for for your comments. So going a little bit a little bit of deeper on, on this, something that you mentioned, it's uh, about the sustainability of internal combustion engines, and all comes from the use of new fuels. So I, I would like to know a little bit uh, what what is in your opinion. Maybe this question is a. Uh, uh, we, we expect different answers from academic partners to industrial partners. So, for example, what are you think the, the bottlenecks in the in the integration of these new fuels into realistic uh, combustion engines? So what is in the in terms of modeling? What are the, the parts that we are missing and that that are not uh, allowing the, the, the computational uh, modeling of these new fuels uh, correct? So if someone wants to say, maybe if we get the, all the questions for everyone, we might be very late. So I prefer to raise the question. If someone uh, would like to, to answer, I can just moderate. Maybe uh, Federico, would you like to, to comment on this? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I, I think that uh, um, the, um, well, uh, I do not see, uh, let's say, a, a specific uh, uh, kind of uh, bottleneck uh, for uh, the application of uh, uh, these, uh, or better for the, the exploitation of this new fuel. I rather see uh, a, a number of uh, uh, still uh, uh, um, not fully explored uh, combination uh, between different uh, fuels, as we have seen some example uh, in last presentation from CAR. Um, uh, possible exploitation of uh, even uh, if we say dual fuel, dual fuel is, uh, as we have seen, uh, a, a word uh, that can uh, encompass uh, a number of different technologies. Uh, and uh, uh, I see uh, rather a, a lack of, uh, uh, <clears throat> for instance, combustion mechanism that can be suitable for this number of uh, possible uh, combination uh, of uh, uh, different uh, fuel and combustion technologies uh, that can be uh, exploited, rather than seeing a, a specific uh, uh, bottleneck in the uh, let's say uh, combustion or emission or uh, fuel injection uh, process. Uh, and in addition to that, and then I will leave uh, to, to Ishil uh, or uh, Jose Maria, uh, <clears throat> I see, uh, for instance, uh, 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 challenges uh, in uh, uh, capturing uh, some uh, uh, features of these new uh, fuels, such as, for instance, uh, for uh, hydrogen capturing uh, the uh, 
uh, ignition characteristics uh, of uh, hydrogen and, uh, for instance, uh, developing uh, uh, CHT simulation that are capable to, to capture the uh, interaction uh, between uh, fuel mixture and the uh, hotspot uh, on the wall and uh, these are uh, or uh, backfiring for uh, hydrogen. These are uh, all uh, issues that uh, require, in my uh, opinion, a substantial effort from the simulation point of view. Okay, uh, Jose Maria, would you like to add something? Yeah, yes. I, I also sort of agree to some extent with Federico in the sense that there is not a particular large difficulty, but I would say maybe more a lack of experience with those fuels. I mean, uh, information uh, or, or base studies have, until now, especially in, in, in automotive or heavy duty, were done with conventional fuels. And now when we want to move to the new one, these new ones, so obviously, first we need to provide information like chemical mechanisms, and these have to be developed. And obviously, like maybe hydrogen or or, or ammonia, there are there are already regular species. But for example, for more sophisticated or, or less 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 conventional fuels like OMX, which are a species that are yeah they were there, but they were not used as fuels so regularly. So I think the, the capability of, of developing good mechanism is, is, is a, something that will come. It's a matter of experience. Again, it's not a bottleneck. Probably a, a, in some years we'll have good and rest. as you sh you've shown, there are already some mechanisms. But uh, yeah, this, this is a work in progress at the moment. OK. And also there is a point uh, we faced um, from our experience. It was the physical properties of, of these fuels, especially these OMIC type fuels, which are again probably the, the, the new ones for us. So that 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 uh, similarly to what um, Carl mentioned about the lack of of uh, data at high pressure for for lamina speed. So there were also lack of physical properties for for these new fuels and. And I think if you want to get uh, good modeling, obviously you need this, this information uh, for, for, for an accurate uh, prediction of, of the, the this, uh, behavior of this new, new field. So that's, that's my main, main point. I mean, we need, uh, this will be solved because fortunately, because of the big experience, I think there are many sources where, where that will create those data, but I think this is still something to come in the upcoming years. Okay, uh, thank you. So as a, as a follow up on this question more for uh, Mushin and, and Gil. So in other uh, disciplines, the simulation of high fidelity simulations uh, are uh, more uh, routinely used uh, by industry and also in academia, for example, for gas turbines. And uh, this is the field I come from. Uh, this more, they are more advanced or they are more used to use uh, high fidelity simulations for the describing the whole combustion process in realistic conditions. So uh, we were uh, wondering uh, what is your, your opinion to say why this is not so much uh, used in the internal combustion engine community? Is this because runs are already good enough or could you comment on this? Uh, maybe mm, maybe yeah. I can, yeah, I can give a comment. But I, I think when you talk about big turbo um, turbine, these are very expensive machine. It's very difficult to optimize them on a test bed. So usually the machine that you build, you're going to sell it to a customers. Uh, we have a bit of simulation, a similar situation with a big two-stroke engine. But I think for the turbine, uh, okay, I think since they came with a new combustion uh, like premixed. Uh, there was really a need to understand uh, what happened, and it's clear that you can't you can't build a lot of prototype with this machine. If you go back to internal combustion, high speed internal combustion engine like diesel engine for 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 truck or farm tractors, I mean it's quite easy to do optimization on a test bed, and I think in general it's cheaper than uh, than than CFD. Uh, I think as long you run with a normal diesel or normal gasoline, I don't think they have so much room 
of improvement uh, with CFD. You know, so CFD, it's more used as a diagnostic to try to detect, okay, if you have maybe too much suit or too much NOx for some operating points. But uh, in general, it's quite cheap to run something on a, on a test bed. If, let's say if you want to run a trade-off or start of injection of rail pressure, it's a question of... Uh, of one hour on a test bed where it's going to take you know maybe one month to have the same trade-off with CFD. Okay, if you want to do have to do some trade-off of swirl or combustion chamber, okay, that could be cheaper with CFD, but you will be also limited in terms of number of operating points you can test. So I think it's it's a question of cost. Regarding marine engine, because I worked for four years in this business, I think there the attitude is more like scaling up and down uh, what they have because they have a very long experience. Uh, I think now they have start to be more interested to do, a, like Carl has shown, to do more optimization, especially regarding dual fuel. But for pure diesel combustion, I don't know. I think it's still cheaper to to do optimization the licensing. I mean, that's that's my opinion. Okay, thank you, uh, Mushin. Yeah, I think uh, Yale's made a very good point. I think uh, the main reason for it to be very popular, especially in the gas turbine industry, is that you know experiments were pretty expensive. Uh, one other thing that I can think of is, you know, uh, when you talk about these HPZ tools, like very high fidelity simulations running on these big machines, even uh, even like our, at Argon machines, I've seen like GE running these very big gas turbine calculations. Uh, so one thing that I've seen is many of these high fidelity tools that can really use up a large computing cluster typically cannot handle kind of, you know, moving meshes, kind of a lot of the other kind of things that happen in IC engines. Gas turbine engines geometries are also very challenging, but, you know, you just mesh it once and kind of, you know, use it forever. Uh, but right now there are a lot of, lot of new developments happening across the world, you know, developing new CFD tools, which can really, uh, you know, really simulate IC engines. So I think that's probably one reason why we kind of start seeing a little bit more uh, HPC being used for IC engines and also, uh, you know, moving towards these more kind of novel combustion concepts, uh, you know, probably simulations can help a little bit more kind of covering a larger range than uh, and in a cheaper sense, you know, with, with the faster machines coming up, uh, see if they can kind of, you know, get closer to the experimental cost if, if you're looking at a wide enough range of conditions. But yeah, like you all said, you know, just something like, you know, uh, st uh, spark timing or start of injection, things like that. We we cannot compete with experimentalists. That's, yeah. It's too costly, no? Yep, yep. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, very interesting. So uh, now I'm just gonna switch a little bit the topic uh, going from modeling to towards small uh, technology uh, and then I would like to say that uh, now this is open uh, discussion uh, with the audience so if someone uh, has any question uh, for any of the speakers uh, please write it on the question and answer section and, and I will just read it or I will give you uh, the, the voice so you can ask the question directly to the speaker in any case, I will continue with uh, some questions that I believe are interesting uh, for, for the audience, but uh, also keep in mind that uh, you can also participate and just write your question in the correct uh, space. So now uh, we've been uh, discussing, uh, it was mentioned from the very first question that uh, the future of uh, uh, internal combustion engines uh, is uh, at risk and, and because of uh, the fuel cells and the batteries. So with these uh, renewable fuels, uh, there is a, a, a clear opportunity to reduce the pollutant emission uh, in, in this kind of uh, engines. So now uh, one of the key questions that everyone asks uh, themselves is from what you see out there in terms of uh, synthetic fuels, what is the most promising fuel that you can see that can be directly integrated into real engines like uh, uh, we have methanol, you have mentioned methanol, you have mentioned hydrogen, uh, OMX, uh, ammonia. So, of course, this, uh, we understand that this uh, depends on the application, but uh, what are, uh, let's say, your, your thoughts on this? What do you think is the most uh, mature technology that can be directly integrated? Maybe uh, I can start uh, from Gilles, uh, just representing the industrial uh, side. 
Well, that's a bit my opinion. I'm not represent. I'm not talking about FPT or, or CNH industrial. Um, in general, I would say that hydrogen is interesting if you have a kind of circular economy like uh, like, like city bus, you know. So you could have a plant producing hydrogen, and then you the bus always comes back. To deploy hydrogen, like the EU is pushing. I think for me, hydrogen first doesn't have a high energy density, so it's a bit. It's like hydrogen must be produced from uh, from electricity, from renewable electricity. So, uh, so at the end, you have to build a, a mega electric uh, distribution network, and you have to add a mega hydrogen distribution network. You know, hydrogen is very difficult to deal with. You know, in terms of logistic, and you need to reach at least a, a pressure of 700 bars in order to compete against uh, electric battery. And, you know, we still know that electric battery in terms of, of density will still maybe double in the future. But I've doubt that you can increase the um, uh, pressure, gas pressure above 700 bars, you know, and probably for heavy duty application will be limited to 350. Regarding other fuel, um, again, I don't see hundreds of, uh, of possibilities. I think it's methanol for spike ignition and it, methanol is very good energy carrier i think in terms of cost methanol can compete with hydrogen because uh, it's easy to store uh, easy to store liquid at ambient it doesn't escape and still methanol you can you can produce other fuel like dme uh, i had a lot of i started to have a lot of interest two years ago with dme dimethyl ether so this is like ome zero because uh, you can produce from biomass or from uh, or e-fuel directly from hydrogen we seen gas process which are very efficient and dme also it's a gas at ambient it's like lpg so at six bars of per i think this lost the connection right or am i pressure is liquid so you can handle it ah. as a liquid so that's the reason why I would replace diesel in the future in some heavy duty application. Cut for one second or one minute. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was cut uh, for some seconds, but. Uh, we, we okay. I can repeat. I don't know why I was cut, but uh, let's say I, I focus mainly on DME because I think this has the highest potential in terms of cost, but also in terms of easiness and in terms of very low uh, exhaust emission. And you can basically even uh, have some retrofit package on diesel engine. So uh, when you use you know, when with DME, uh, you have the only issue is NOx basically. But since you don't produce soot, you can use a lot of EGR, for example. But let's say with the latest ATS technology that will come in the next five, 10 years, and when we talk about Euro 7 emission, we can barely even measure NOx emission coming from the, the latest after treatment system. So I, I would say DME is a quite good candidate because it's easy to handle. Okay, thank you. And uh, some additional comments uh, from the others, uh, Federico? Uh, yes, I basically agree uh, with, uh, with Gilles. Uh, just would like to uh, highlight uh, uh, that, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, fight uh, these uh, uh, mainstream uh, uh, thought or mantra that uh, electrification can solve uh, all our problems. Uh, I do not believe that uh, one size fits all. So depending on the specific application, uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, internal combustion engine with the proper fuel can uh, still uh, provide a valuable contribution uh, to reduce uh, CO2 emission. Concerning hydrogen, uh, I, uh, I think uh, this can be uh, an interesting option for some specific application, uh, even used in internal combustion engine, for instance, uh, uh, city bus uh, that uh, uh, she mentioned are kind of perfect application because you have a captive fleet. You do not uh, uh, need a big infrastructure for refueling. You have a, a limited mileage in terms of typically daily emission of the vehicle. 
and uh, you can be uh, extremely competitive in terms of uh, uh, ECO in comparison with uh, fuel cell. So I think this is a, a kind of ideal uh, application for uh, this kind of uh, fuel. Uh, along with other similar applications such as truck for garbage collection in urban environment and uh, uh, similar kind of uh, fleet. Uh, I do not see it uh, as a, a, again a, a solution that can fit all application. For instance, uh, I, I do not believe that this can be uh, uh, the right way to go for uh, light duty vehicles, uh, for which, uh, for sure, batteries are uh, expected to, to uh, win the competition. And uh, <clears throat> I do not see uh, so much uh, room. Uh, but uh, for instance, for long haul trucks, uh, uh, I do not believe that uh, all electric truck uh, uh, can be a solution, even if uh, uh, there are these uh, uh, <clears throat> example uh, by uh, Tesla, also by by Cummins of these all electric truck. This does not make any sense in in my opinion and. For this kind of application, I think that uh, a, a renewable uh, liquid fuel has uh, a, a, an energy density that cannot be challenged by uh, any other uh, technology. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Jose Maria Musin, would you like to add something on this uh, fundamental question? Well, in my case, I, I would like also to mention uh, couple of things so I'm um, did also uh, started with this, with this GME which is OME zero so all this family of OME type fuels are currently being heavily investigated especially by German German uh, companies and and research institutions and probably they are worth uh, an opportunity pro in terms of, of also use usefulness. There are also there's sort of the question of the of the price you have to pay because obviously they are higher molecules so you need a more complex production process that means lower efficiency in the production and this I think this is one of the key points because in the end this may not turn into emissions if you handle it properly but it turns into money and expense uh, some some funding you need to 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 do that so. But still, probably OMX are also soot-free um, uh, fuel. So we showed it in the in, in the simulation. You showed it again that the, the OME produces a uh, very low soot precursors, and maybe for I would say um, yeah uh, heavy-duty applications, they are still worth. Uh, uh, and an, an opportunity maybe for for large maritime applications they they use huge quantities of, of fuels and there the cost is really important i see more methanol or even even an ammonia which is also uh, as, as an alternative actually ammonia is receiving currently a lot of uh, thrust from the european union and probably this this can help um, yeah uh, spread the, the use of that on on, on on this large marine sector but uh, yeah uh, probably not for for the uh, smaller size engines i would say thank you um Mushin, would you like to to add something i think everything was kind of covered uh so kind of you know within us i mean again this is just based on my current understanding with the current administration kind of the direction we are going with the light duty space is, you know, yeah, basically electrification is the solution. And within heavy duty and medium duty, uh, you know, marine applications, there seems to be a little bit more push towards hydrogen and ammonia. Uh, but again, uh, we'll have to see how it goes. But I think, again, I'm not an expert in this field, so I'll probably not mention too much, but I think all the points that were mentioned were uh, pretty helpful.
Okay, uh, well, I would say at the end, as researchers, we are driven by the, the, the political interests. So at the end, in the European Union, at least, they have made a very clear position against the use of uh, conventional fuels. And, and of course, uh, this might not be the, the best or the optimal uh, strategy for transportation and power generation, but the, the politicians are now really pushing hard on this. So as researchers, uh, we have to adapt and, and, and try to identify what are the alternatives, no? And, and I don't know if uh, anyone in the audience uh, has uh, any question or any comment. Uh, it doesn't need to be a question. Uh, it's uh, more like a comment or, or, or a remark about the discussion that uh, we had today. Uh, if I am allowed, uh, Daniel, just to... Uh, I don't want to shift the discussion into a more philosophical <laughs> ground, mm -hmm. but uh, I would, uh, let's say, respectfully disagree uh, with uh, your last uh, statement. I think that uh, we as researchers uh, should uh, be committed to drive uh, uh, the uh, political choices uh, into the right direction. And uh, then the question is, what, which is the right direction? The, the direction that is, uh, uh, let's say, effective in uh, uh, preserving our environment and is not uh, uh, driven by uh, emotional uh, reasons or rather uh, by the uh, attempt uh, to gain consensus uh, uh, and so to uh, make the choice uh, uh, that uh, uh, the people seems to, to want because sometimes this is not uh, a, a rational choice. Uh, there is, uh, uh, in my opinion, a kind of uh, uh, electrification hype at the moment, uh, it seems that only electrification can uh, solve our problem, can allow us to uh, reach our target of uh, decarbonizing transport. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, we should not uh, discard a priori uh, some technologies or some choices and uh, uh, the, the politician uh, should remain, uh, uh, let's say, technology neutral. They, they should set target and uh, uh, they should not uh, dictate a technology uh, rather than another one. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is indeed the, what would be the, the, the best uh, the best strategy for Europe. I don't know if this is follow at least in my country that the, and other countries in Europe, but of course uh, this should be the the, the ideal situation. Uh, we have a comment uh, from Shauki. Would you like to add something? I think. Uh, you... Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, th thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to. Uh, share information. Uh, in uh, recently at uh, my institution, I, I, IFP Energy Nouvelle, there is a, a new study that uh, uh, is in uh, has showed that uh, uh, in the future, uh, battery is uh, is uh, and electrification is uh, the main stream. But uh, it uh, has posed the question, is there battery for everybody? So the, the answer is that, uh, in fact, it's not possible to have battery for everybody, even for, for uh, a particular uh, and uh, particulate uh, vehicle for small vehicle. So even for small vehicle in, uh, in the future, uh, we need to have, uh, we, we need to still working on uh, internal combustion engine, of course, with uh, uh, renewable fuels, 
but uh, uh, we will need uh, uh, internal combustion engine. So I, I wanted to share with you this uh, this information. Uh, you can find the the, the, the study on uh, uh, LinkedIn uh, with IFP. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for, for the remark. Um, yeah, I would like to thank you all the participants uh, for this interesting discussion and from your time. Uh, it was very interesting and I think we, we have to, to come to an end. It's been quite a long time just watching directly on the screen. Uh, we thank you, the speakers and the members of the round table. Now uh, Mireia is going to share um, a questionnaire that uh, is extremely short. Uh, it is, uh, only will take you some seconds so we can really get a good feedback uh, of uh, how we can improve uh, this kind of uh, seminars uh, for the future. So. I would like uh, you to just to take some time to to feel, to answer the questions uh, when when you get some time, and with this uh, I uh, I thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with all of you, and now uh, I will leave the word to Jose Maria. Maybe you might want to to conclude the the, the discussion. Yeah. So I think um, I think it's we all realize that we move easily to this, uh, let's say, political and, and, and technological situation because this is a really a hot topic. Uh, probably more, even more important that, let's say, HPC as an as a environment nowadays. But, well, that's, that's the way it is. I think it's a challenging time and, and we need also, as, as Federico said, we need also to... to to try to show what we think is the right answer from a technological point of view, an environmental point of view, which is not always good to hear. Um, yeah, I thank all the speakers and also the panelists for, for joining this. I hope you, again, uh, find, you have found it worth the time. And yeah, I hope we can, we can keep in touch with all this engine community because one, one relevant thing from the engine community is that they like to collaborate and work together. And that, that's still something that can be lost if, if our research field gets shrunk and, and, and disappears. So I think this is really a really scientific contribution that, that cannot be lost, okay? I thank all of them uh, again. And yeah, I think we can meet in the future, okay? Thanks also to the audience, and I hope we had a good number of participations, and and I also hope that maybe if you can, for those who are, have already left, if you happen to know them, please send send them the the the, the survey so that we can uh, get the feedback and about the the if this was what you expected or or uh, what if there were missing points or if we did really really what you expected. Okay. Okay, thank you. We will send, the, I think Mireya will send an email to all the registration. Okay, great. For, for if you thank you, thank that. you, goodbye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye, thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks to all. Bye. Bye.